the topic I will be covering is wound care. Future Nurses of America, when you think about wound care or wounds, when you think about wounds, what is a nursing diagnosis for a patient with a wound? When I think about a patient with a wound, I think about the patient being at risk for infection. Anytime an individual's skin is open, they are at risk for infection. The skin actually serves as a protective covering that prevents germs and debris and that type of thing from entering the body. So whenever there's a break in your skin integrity or individual skin integrity, the individual is at risk for infection. Another nursing diagnosis for an individual with a wound can be um, being at risk for hemorrhage, where you have a wound, the wound is capable of bleeding. You know, some uh, people wound may bleed profusely where they are at risk for hemorrhage. They are at risk for bleeding out. And of course, the individual is at risk for, uh, for pain, depending on what stage they are in with their wound. Okay. And looking down, it's uh, talking about the different types of wounds. Um, and it talks about wounds are cat categorized as either open um, or closed. A wound in which the skin remains intact is considered a closed wound. A wound in which the skin integrity has been breached is an open wound. In addition to being categorized as open or closed, wounds may be classified as contusions, abrasions, puncture wounds, penetrating wounds, lacerations, or pressure injuries. And it talks about contusions, how contusions can present as a um, bruise, which may occur from some form of blunt trauma talks about abrasions, um, a superficial open wound, puncture wounds, you know that something actually uh, opened up a wound or opened up an area. Talk about penetrating wounds where a penetrating wound is similar to a puncture wound. However, the penetrating wound is um, by an offending object remains embedded in the tissue. Talks about lacerations, where lacerations are cutting or tearing of tissue. And it talks about pressure injuries. And we know pressure injuries occurs from too much pressure on something, whether the pressure be um, self-inflicted or whether it's to a point where the um, Pressure is occurring from equipment, because sometimes, you know, pressure injuries occur uh, due to the pressure that comes from equipment. It talks about contamination of wounds. And with contamination wounds, it talks about um, the contaminated wound, typically an actual contaminated wound occurs from somebody breaking aseptic technique. And you know, aseptic technique is where you are doing some type of procedure. Um, it's more so a germ-free technique. You know, and a lot of procedures require complete asepsis, where you're doing everything to prevent introducing a particular area to a germ. It talks about an infected wound. Um, and with an infected wound, some of the things that you can anticipate on seeing is inflammation. Um, you may see purulent drainage, which is pus. You may even see necrotic tissue. Okay. And then it actually points out different signs of infection. And some of this is uh, signs of inflammation. Um, erythema is the redness. Um, which is a sign of inflammation. When you see an inflamed areas, it typically uh, feel warm. You know, another sign of inflammation, that edema 
uh, can be a sign of inflammation. Pain comes with inflammation as well. And we know any word with itis, I-T-I-S, at the end of it, that is inflammation. Okay. And it talks about colonized wounds. With the colonized wounds, it will be a wound that actually has germs in it, different microorganisms in it. However, no infection is uh, present or there aren't any signs of infection. And it's talking about pressure injuries. Pressure injuries are also called the cubitus ulcers um, or a bed sore or a pressure ulcer. Um, typically, a lot of people like to call pressure injuries pressure ulcers. Uh, some people feel a stage one technically isn't a uh, pressure ulcer because a stage one presents with complete redness. And for me, when I think of an ulcer, the word ulcer, I'm more so thinking of an open sore, like some type of open sore. But it talks about with um, pressure injuries, you know, what are the causes of pressure injuries? What are the causes of pressure ulcers? What causes? it? And typically it's caused by too much pressure to a particular um, area where oxygenation and blood flow is being cut off. Um, pressure injuries also occur due to equipment, where some equipment is putting too much pressure on a given area, where it will cause the skin to initially turn red, and then the skin begins to break down. Okay. Okay, so the book is talking about the most common sites for development of pressure injury. And typically the most common sites are the bony prominence area. Some of those areas that we put the most pressure on our body. And looking at this individual in bed, you see he's putting a lot of pressure at his heels. You know, that is a common site for pressure injury for these patients are putting a lot of pressure on this area. The um, bottom, the individual's bottom, as far as the sacral area, is a common site for um, pressure ulcers. Let me show you other areas that individuals are um, at most risk for pressure ulcer development. And it talks about some of the individuals who are at higher risk for pressure ulcer development. Talks about the um, elderly population due to the changes in their skin, where the skin is becoming a lot thinner and less elastic. Um, malnourished individuals at risk for pressure ulcer development. Um, individuals who are incontinent of bowel and bladder where the individual is urinating or pooping on themselves, that moisture can increase um, the risk for skin breakdown. Individuals who are immobile, if I'm immobile, I really cannot move around. Maybe I'm stuck in the same position being immobile. So I'm at risk for a pressure ulcer. And with being immobile, you know, some of the education a nurse wants to offer the individual Hey, make sure you reposition yourself at the um, longest every two hours. You know, when maybe the patient can't move their legs, but they still have upper arm strength where the nurse is teaching them how to kind of move around. I want to see you kind of move, you know, get them a time frame to prevent um, pressure ulcer development. And it also informs you individuals with impaired circulation and chronic metabolic conditions are at risk for pressure ulcer development as well. Well, pressure ulcers, um, there are different stages to pressure ulcers. There are different stages to pressure ulcers. And as a future nurse, uh, you may actually have your CNAs where CNAs are trained, you know, to look at the patient's skin and report to the nurse any changes in condition. And, you know, the, most of the time, or not most of the time, 
the first sign of a pressure ulcer is complete redness. So you will have CNAs who will report to you, hey, nurse, 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 you know, come look at uh, Ms. Rogers' skin. You know, it's completely red, nurse. And we're looking at Ms. Rogers' skin, just to say it's on her bottom, you looking at it initially, you assessing, and then you will have to palpate. And palpating is where you take your fingertips and you put pressure over this area. You take your fingertips and put pressure over this area. And we're putting pressure over that red and area. If it turns like pale and then it turns back red, it's not a stage one pressure ulcer. Now, however, if you um, put pressure with your fingertips over that red and area, you press in, um, into the red and area and it remains red, meaning it's not blanchable, it's non-blanchable, that is a stage one pressure ulcer. Talks about a stage two pressure ulcer, how a stage two pressure ulcer can um, initially appear as a blister. It appears as a um, serum field blister, or it can appear as a broken blister that reveals shallow pink or um, ulcerated skin, okay? Talks about a stage three pressure ulcer. With a stage three pressure ulcer, you are more so um, seeing undermining and you will see tunneling. And you will probably see that on a lot of tests, which pressure ulcer presents with um, undermining and tunneling, and more than likely it's a stage three. Um, and typically with a stage three, there is damage um, to the epidermis, the epi, epi normally mean on top of something, um, dermis and subcutaneous tissue. Let me get some of the different uh, pressure ulcers on the illustration. And it talks about a stage four pressure ulcer where the stage four pressure ulcer um, involves deep tissue necrosis, um, where the muscle, the tendon, the bone, it all is exposed. It all is actually um, exposed. And to look at these, which one appears to be a stage four? This redness that's non-blanchable is definitely a stage one. You got the um, open um, skin, you know, appearing as a stage two. And with the stage four, when you're seeing that necrotic tissue, you're seeing bone, tendon, and muscle, you definitely know that's a stage four. And looking at this pressure um, ulcer, this is considered a, um, an unstageable, an unstageable. And the reason it's the unstageable because you see um, the skin is covering this injury. And due to the skin covering the injury, you cannot see what's inside of it. You cannot see inside of this, that type of thing. So it's unstageable because if we were to remove this skin, it may expose a stage four pressure ulcer or even a stage three where you're seeing tunneling and undermining. And you see, this is a deep tissue injury. F is a deep tissue injury where um, a deep tissue injury may be intact or non-intact skin. It may form a, a blood field blister or thin blister that overrides, overlies a dark wound bed. Okay. And typically the um, deep tissue injury in my eyes, it looks a little like a bruise, but the deep tissue injury typically appears, you know, this purplish maroon color. And they tell you, just for testing purposes, that'd be a question, hey, what color do the deep tissue pressure injury um, appear? And it's typically deep red, maroon, or purple in color. 
And there are some uh, variations with wounds as far as the um, color different wounds may appear. Because dark skinned people, with them being darker, you know, the wound may appear a little different. As, well, a stage one pressure ulcer may appear a bit different. And it talks about the braiding scale. As future nurses, you would definitely uh, do a braiding scale on your patients. And a braiding scale is a predictor for um, pressure ulcer. Um, in, I mean, for it's a predictor for pressure ulcer development. The braiding scale is a predictor for pressure ulcer development. And typically, the higher an individual score, the least they are at risk for pressure ulcer development. And with the Braden scale, it's actually looking at um, an individual sensory uh, perception. And with an individual sensory perception, it's asking for the highest points, um, no impairment to sensory perception, uh, meaning the individual responds to verbal commands, has no sensory deficits, which will limit ability to feel or voice pain or discomfort. It's um, asking a, a nurse to rate the patient uh, for moisture. You know, is this patient incontinent? Do this patient an incontinent mean where there is loss um, of the ability to actually, um, loss of the control of your bowel and bladder? There's loss of um, bowel and bladder where if I am urinating on myself, or having bowel movements, um, you know, that moisture can contribute to skin breakdown. It can contribute to pressure ulcer development. It's asking about an individual um, activity. You know, is this individual active as far as is the individual able to walk? Um, is the individual um, bed bound? That type of thing. They mobility, they nutrition, where it's asking about their appetite. You know, do this individual um, have an excellent appetite or is the individual appetite poor? And that asks about friction and shearing. And friction and shearing um, refers to actually kind of sitting in a position where you get skin kind of smashed up, you're putting a lot of pressure on it, you know, or even um, being slid up in, in the bed. Where sometimes when we slide an individual up in bed, their skin actually breaks down. It contributes or their skin kind of rub up against the surface and it causes um, some damage to the skin. It can actually tear the skin. And friction, um, friction is the um, example of actually, you know, pulling an individual up in bed and their skin rubbing up against something. It's more so a blockage of um, blood flow. Something causes, some too much pressure is causing a block in blood flow. And it talks about prevention of pressure injuries. What are some things that we actually can do to prevent the development of pressure injuries? So if I know that pressure injuries is caused by too much pressure on um, a particular area or more so the bony prominences. Um, one, if the patient is immobile, you know, you want to ensure the patient is being repositioned where you educating the patient, you educating a support system, you educating the healthcare workers. Hey, we have to reposition this individual um, at the longest every two hours to prevent the skin from breaking down or to prevent pressure ulcer. Um, development. Um, keeping a patient dry. If you're dealing with an incontinent patient, you know you have to keep the individual dry. You know the patient um, had a bowel movement, the patient urinated. You want to clean them up um, as quick as possible. And even encouraging patients to eat, you know, monitoring a um, diet, monitoring what they're eating, monitoring are they eating enough that type of thing. And we know with pressure injuries, individuals need to increase their calorie intake. Um, and they also need to increase protein. 
protein. Okay. Are there um, any other things that we can do to prevent pressure ulcer development? Are there any other things that we can do to prevent pressure ulcers from developing? One of the things that I can uh, think of is the linen on an individual's bed, it needs to be wrinkle free. The linen needs to be wrinkle free because if I'm uh, bed bound and I'm sitting on uh, wrinkled linen, it can contribute to pressure ulcer development. Um, pressure ulcer development can occur from equipment being too tight. What equipment do you think can contribute to pressure ulcer development? Because the equipment that I can think of is the nasal cannula, the oxygen tubing that we normally see a lot of people wear, where it's on the ears, it's in the nose, it's blowing the oxygen in the nose, the nasal cannula, you know, it can contribute to pressure ulcer development behind the ears. Because if you have that tubing on too tight, it can start to uh, cause the ears to begin to break down. And typically as a nurse with your patients, you should be doing a head to toe assessment. And in a different setting, some nurses are required to do a head to toe assessment daily, while other nurses are required to do um, head to toe assessments periodically or as needed. And with doing a head to toe assessment, you are looking at your patient from head to toe. And you're looking at them from head to toe to see hey, is there any skin breakdown? Is there any abnormalities that I need to report to the physician? You know, um, and you know, even we're looking at the skin breakdown because it's really important when you have a new patient as a future nurse to do head to toe assessments on them. Because if a patient have a pressure ulcer just seeing behind their ear or the crack of their um, buttocks, because that's a common area um, to see a pressure ulcer and a nurse didn't document it, after a certain amount of time, it's as if the individual got the pressure ulcer from the faci facility that they were admitted to. And that facility can be held responsible for that pressure ulcer. Okay. The chapter is also talking about other wounds found in hospitalized patients. It talks about stasis ulcers. And with stasis ulcers, they typically occur due to damaged valves. They occur due to damaged valves and the damaged valves may cause blood to begin pooling, that type of thing. Um, and with the stasis ulcers, you will see ulcers more so form on the lower extremities. And I think they appear brownish. They typically appear brownish. Most of the time you will see them on the um, malleus of the ankle. And it comes with a lot of drainage. Talks about sinus tracts. Sinus tracts is uh, sometimes called a fistula. Um, the sinus tracts are an opening or passageway that can form in any direction. And this is actually a fistula between the rectum and the vagina, where you see this opening that should not um, actually be there, and it can contribute to infection development. It talks about surgical um, inc incisions which is another wound found in hospitalized uh, patients. And you know, a surgical incision occurs due to a surgery. And typically with the surgical incisions, they are sharply defined edges um, than most wounds. So it's kind of a, a real, um, like a perfected um, incision. Okay. It's also talking about wound healing, where there are three phases to wound healing. So it talks about with wound healing, whether the wound is a surgical incision or a pressure injury or is due to trauma, 
the steps in the healing process are the same and occurs in three phases. And the three phases are the inflammatory phase, the reconstructive um, phase, and the maturation phase. And with the inflammatory phase, the wound is being closed by um, clotting. The wound closes by clotting. Anytime we have an open um, area, we have a skin tear or an abrasion, that type of thing, the thing that actually stops the drainage will, uh, will be clotting. A clot will actually form. And the clot actually protects um, the wound from contamination and stops fluid from leaving the body, which presents as inflammation. The clot presents as inflammation. And we know that inflammation is the, um, the redness at the site, the warmth, the um, edema, and even pain will be present with inflammation. Um, also with the clotting of the area, the body also sends white blood cells to the clotted area to engulf and digest debris and microorganisms. And this actually show you all a surgical incision that is well approximated. And as a nurse, when you are doing your head to toe assessment, any scars that you see on the patient's body, they need to be questioned. Hey, how did you get this? You know, you want to question everything. What caused this? You know, and with this one, if this is my patient and I'm looking at it, I can definitely tell that this um, recently occurred. Hey, did you have recent surgery? You know, you want to ask about it. And then even looking at this, where I'm seeing a surgical incision, I know there's a possibility the individual may be in pain. So you want to question their pain. Hey, are you in any pain? Hey, it, where's the pain? You know, how the pain feel? Is it sharp pain, throbbing, burning? Um, is it a numbness? That type of thing, you want to question it. But again, wound healing occurs in three phases, the inflammatory uh, phase, the reconstruction phase, as well as the um, maturation phase. And with the reconstruction phase, wound begins to heal and last uh, for about 21 days after injury, the proliferation phase. With the proliferation phase, um, the fiber um, blast produces collagen, which is a tough protein material that forms scar tissue and helps strengthen the muscles. The capillaries produce new tissue called granulation tissue. If the granulation tissue is irritated, it can bleed easily because this tissue is fragile. When you increase a wound, oh, excuse me, when you measure a wound and find that it's getting smaller, filling with deep pink to light red tissue, you know that the wound healing on uh, or granulation is occurring. The wound is healing or granulation is actually occurring. It talks about the maturation phase of wound healing. The maturation phase is also called the remodeling phase. The wound contracts and the scar strengthens, which gives the area extra support to prevent um, the reopening of the wound. And it tells you overproduction of collagen results in a thick raised scar, which is keloid skin, over, which is due to overproduction of uh, collagen. So it talks about different types of wound closure or healing where, where first intention um, closures will occur for, for a wound that is more so like a surgical intent, um, incision that's well approximated where this um, surgical incision, it can be sutured closed. It can more so be sutured closed where this one is stapled. And it talks about second intention is where the arm, um, it's more so for 
a wound such as a pressure ulcer where um, it's greater tissue loss, you know, the wound is not approximated, that type of thing. This actual wound, the wound uh, that will close due to second infection, it has to be pretty much left open to actually heal, leave it open to heal. And third intention is more so first intention as well as second intention where the wound is left open to heal and then the wound is sutured closed. Okay. And question, when you think about the inflammatory phase of wound healing, what medication do you feel would be most effective? What medication would be effective for the inflammatory phase of um, wound healing? And when I think about the medication that would be effective, I'm thinking more so about NSAIDs, the non-steroidal um, anti-inflammatory drugs, any drugs that will be against inflammation will um, be effective to contribute to pain relief. So some type of anti-inflammatory, where we know anti is against inflammation, is to kind of prevent the inflammation. It talks about factors affecting wound healing, um, that there are a number of factors that can delay the healing process. And it talks about age being a factor. Uh, actually affect wound healing due to the older individual and being less the glass less elastic to the younger individual. Talk about how chronic illness can affect wound healing. You know, diabetics being diabetic decreases Um, healing of a wound, chronic illnesses, diabetes, lifestyle choices, um, smoking cigarettes can actually um, decrease oxygen content of the blood and constrict blood vessels, impeding circulation to wounds. Alcohol intake can contribute to decrease wound healing. Medications, one of the medications is steroids how steroids, um, due to steroids increasing your blood sugar, which may result in drug-induced diabetes, um, it can affect um, the wound healing process. Yep, so there are several factors that can contribute uh, to decrease wound healing. It talks about complications of wound healing. What complications can you all think of that will occur or that can occur? Because I can think of comp um, the complication that can affect the wound healing is infection. Um, one of the most common wound complications is infection. And most commonly, uh, the infections are caused by uh, methicillin, Resistance um, aureus is a type of um, infection, MRSA, okay. E. coli infections um, is a complication that can affect wound healing. And some of these infections cause a patient will result in the patient need, needing to be put in um, isolation where you need to wear your personal protective equipment to even provide care for these um, individuals. So all of these, the um, MRSA, E. coli, um, Clostridia, all of these are um, bacterial infections where the individual will have to take some type of antibiotic um, in order for the infection to resolve. And it talks about debridement. Um, and a debridement can be a process of surgically removing dead tissue. 
And there are other ways to debride a wound. And it's just talking about some of the signs and symptoms of wound infection. As a nurse, what will make you, what will make, let you know, hey, there's a possibility this individual have a wound infection. And for me, I know the drainage can be a sign of wound infection, swelling, redness, um, fever, even smell where, hey, that don't smell normal. And those are things that are reportable to the physician. Any change of condition should be reported to the physician. The physician should be notified. It's talking about wound dehiscence and evisceration. Wound dehiscence and evisceration. The first pitch, picture that you actually see or the picture you actually see show you wound dehiscence. And with wound dehiscence, it's where a surgical um, wound, it actually opens up. It opens up. And that can uh, be considered, or it is an emergency. The nurse needs to respond if a surgical wound actually opens up. And part of the response is the nurse needs to grab, um, this would be require an aseptic technique. You will grab some uh, four by four gauze um, and place it over the um, open area. And you will pour normal saline over it keeping it moist. You want to elevate the patient's head to about a 30 degree, which is semi-fowler's position. You want to elevate the individual's feet some. And wound evisceration, wound evisceration is the opening of a wound as well. However, internal organs protrude out. Internal organs protrude out. This is a medical emergency. And saying that you, um, same thing you did for the patient who experienced wound dehiscence, same thing you would do for the patient who's experiencing wound evisceration. You will actually place a four by four over the open area and you will actually um, keep it moist with normal saline. You wanna elevate the, the head of the bed uh, to a semi-fowler position. Um, while the patient is laying flat on a back and elevate the individual's feet or feet, sorry. And be clear, if wound evisceration occur, do not try to replace the organ into the abdominal cavity. You have to prepare the patient for surgery. The patient will have to go in for emergency surgery. So the patient needs to be in PO. The patient needs to be MPO in preparation for surgery. Okay. Talks about hemorrhage. And with hemorrhage, um, it is uh, considered bleeding profusely. Bleeding profusely. And if an individual is bleeding profusely, it is considered a medical emergency. A large amount of bright red blood indicates bleeding from an artery. Patients taking anticoagulation medicines, medications, blood thinners, and those with clotting disorders are at risk for hemorrhage postoperatively. So typically if an individual has a, a surgery scheduled, um, they will be told not to um, take anticoagulant therapy, not to continue the anticoagulant therapy typically to prevent them from um, bleeding out because we know anticoagulants are against coagulation, which keeps the blood thin. And with hemorrhage, you may actually, um, an individual can have experience internal or external um, Hemorrhage and internal hemorrhage, meaning they bleeding out in the inside. And there are clinical manifestations of that external hemorrhaging. They are bleeding where we actually can see it on the outside. And typically, um, there are changes that will occur if an individual is uh, hemorrhaging. 
and you know the individual may um, become pale, um, pulse may become rapid and thready, you know, they will become hypotensive, cool um, to touch, clammy skin, you know, those are different signs of uh, hemorrhage. And of course, hemorrhage can ultimately result in death. So hemorrhage is a medical um, emergency. And it talks about wound treatment. You will provide wound care as ordered by the healthcare provider. Treatment will differ for each wound. And some nursing students love wound care. Some um, nurses love wound care. And some of you will become wound care nurses. So, you know, this chapter is good to kind of um, point different things out for you with dealing with different wounds, you know, how to, um, what contributes to wound healing. What patients do you have where you can anticipate, hey, this patient um, wound may be delayed for healing. You know, it may be some delayed wound healing, that type of thing. It talks about how wounds can be closed with sutures or um, staples. And typically the sutures and staples are removed after seven to 14 days. We talked about nursing responsibilities for sutures and staple care and the responsibilities that a nurse will include assessment of the suture line. Um, and with assessing it, you actually looking, do you see any signs of infection along this suture line? If so, it needs to be reported to the physician, that type of thing. It talks about drains and drainage. Um, patients who have wounds, you know, wounds may present with drainage and they tell you um, some of the drainage may be sanguineous drainage, which is um, drainage that look like blood. They may have present with sero sanguineous drainage. Sero is more so the clear fluid drainage. I mean, the sanguineous is blood. Um, and some people will present with serous drainage, which is more so clear to slightly yellow fluid where you document and um, wound bed has necrotic tissue, um, serous drainage was noted or serosanguineous drainage was noted. You need to be clear with what these terms actually um, mean, okay? And it talks about um, when a, a wound is expected to produce, I mean, when a wound is expected to produce drainage, the surgeon will place a drain in the wound. And the drain can be a closed or open drain. It talks about clo closed drains attached to a device um, would be something like the Hemovac or the Jackson Pratt um, drain, where that closed drain would be used to um, pretty much to collect the fluids, to collect the fluids from the wounds. The Penrose drain um, is an open drain. A flat tube is inserted in a wound during surgery. Then it's brought out through uh, a stab wound or a slit in the skin. Open drains provide a pathway for pathogens to reach the wound. So that's one of the um, downsides of a Penrose drain or an open drain. Okay. And again, it um, talks about the type of wound drainage. You want to look over that and make sure you're clear with the different types of wound drainage. And we talk about seroperulent. What was seroperulent wound drainage make you think? Because for me, the perulent, uh, we know that's pus. That's a sign of infection. So it's going to make me think infection. Can this show you the different drains where this is the Penrose um, drain, hemo drain, hemo vet? And this talks about nursing responsibilities when your patients actually have a, um, a drain. When your patients actually have a drain, um, you need to empty the drain every eight hours or when they um, become one half to two thirds full. And that needs to be documented. You need to document 
how much drainage did you answer it? I mean, did you empty? Because that's considered output. That is fluids that are coming, uh, that is leaving the individual's body. That would be considered output. You need to document how much drainage you poured out and at what time was the drainage poured out? Because we need to be clear on how um, much fluid is leaving the individual body. How much fluid is leaving the individual body? Because it may be too much fluid where you need to report it to the physician immediately. Okay. We talked about measurement of wounds and observation of um, drainage. So these are some of the things you need to document as a wound care nurse or even providing wound care. The things that you need to document, you need to document, um, and typically they say look at the um, wound itself as if it's a clock. So the top of that clock would be considered 12 o'clock. The uh, side, more so the right side, is three o'clock. The um, bottom would be six o'clock, nine o'clock, that type of thing. So to measure the length, they normally say you will measure from 12 to six. To measure the width, you will measure from um, nine to three. That would be considered the width. But when you are documenting on a wound, you want to document how do the wound look? How do the wound look? Do the wound have any drainage? Document the drainage. What is the color of the uh, drainage? Make sure you're documenting the length, the width, the depth of the um, wound. You need to document the surrounding skin. Is the surrounding skin within normal limits for that individual's ethnicity? Okay. You want to document, is it open? Is it closed? How do the tissue look? How do the wound bed look? You want to document the amount of drainage. How much drainage? Is it scant drainage? Is it copious um, amounts of drainage? And you want to document the patient pain. Okay. Okay. And it talks about cleaning wounds. With cleaning wounds, we need to clean in a circular motion of the skin, starting as close as possible to the drain. If we clean it uh, with a drain and move outward in a larger circle. So typically, just to say if this O was the um, wound, the O right here in cleaning wounds, if the O was the wound, you pretty much want to start at the middle of that wound and going outward. Start at the middle, going outward, using different um, portions of whatever material you're using to clean. You always wanna go outwards. Because if you actually go inwards with cleaning the wound, that means that you bring in what's on the outside in. You bring in germs in, putting that patient at risk for infection. However, we always wanna start from the middle and work our way out. That way we are removing. We are removing that type of thing. And when we have to clean wounds, the most common irrigant will be uh, normal saline. That's the most common irrigant, will be normal saline or 0.9 uh, saline. And if a different fluid is used, it needs to be ordered by the physician. Um, it also talks about um, ordering, uh, um, obtaining a wound culture. And a wound culture, anytime I'm hearing the word culture, I know that we testing for infection. We're looking for some type of infection anytime I'm hearing culture. Sometimes the physicians say, hey, get a culture and sensitivity where the culture is to see if it's a germ present, a pathogen present. And the sensitivity is to figure out what antibiotics will be effective for this germ. What antibiotics will really work for this germ? What antibiotics is this germ going to be sensitive to? Okay. And it talks about dressings where um, typically with the appropriate dressing for each wound, the physician um, would decide what dressing is appropriate. Some facilities have um, like a protocol you follow. If a patient have a stage one, put this on it. 
if the patient has a skin tear, put this on it. But if the facility uh, that you're working at don't have a protocol, you need to uh, reach out to the physician, but you need to reach out to the physician, period. Anytime there is um, a change in a resident's uh, condition, the physician needs to be notified. If the patient have a guardian, you need to notify the guardian as well. Notify the guardian of the change in condition, notify the physician as well. Okay. So it do talk about different dressings. And with dressings, sometimes we will put a dressing on a patient prophylactically, where if we kind of see that you immobile and you favor laying on that um, right on the show heel, maybe you're putting a lot of pressure on your heel, we might put a dressing on your heel to prevent the skin from breaking down. And also, you know, the physician may order a boot because they have specialized boots that prevent um, pressure ulcer development as well. But with some of the different dressings, physician may order a wet to um, damp dressing. And it's uh, the wet to damp dressing, wound dressings are considered to maintain a moist wound bed and to wick out drainage from the wound. The most common dressings you will apply are transparent film dressings and hydrocolloid dressings. And this talks about that there are several types of dressings the physicians may uh, order. And this, this uh, table talks about some of the different dressings and purposes for uh, the dressings. Talked about with different dressings, um, things that actually hold uh, the dressings in place. Um, you have Montgomery straps that may be used to hold dressings in place, abdominal binders that may be used to hold dressings in place. And with the um, abdominal binders, you know, abdominal binders may be beneficial for the patient. Um, who actually had some type of abdominal surgery, you know, to prevent wound dehiscence and even, um, or wound evisceration. When you are dealing with patients who had some type of abdominal surgery, you want to educate that patient who had abdominal surgery. And um, some of the education will reflect on preventing uh, wound dehiscence and wound evisceration. And what education could you give them? Hey, if you need to cough, you need to put a pillow over your abdomen and you need to splint. That will prevent you from um, experiencing wound dehiscence or wound de um, evisceration. And even physicians may order a, an abdominal binder to prevent wound dehiscence and wound evisceration. Um, I'm gonna say that's it for this chapter. Make sure you all read the entire chapter. Make sure you read the entire chapter that you grasp all the content, okay?